Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Insights, Newcastle University's public lectures series. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this week's lecture. Uh, my name is Martin Farr. I'm co-chair of the Public Lectures Committee. Um, a few bits of housekeeping you'll probably be expecting. Uh, please could you ensure your phones are on silent? Uh, not expecting a fire alarm. In the event of one, please follow the directions out into the lobby and the car park. Uh, if you'd like to tweet about, or X rather, about tonight's event, uh, it's hashtag InsightsNCL, hashtag insights NCL. Uh, there'll be questions after the lecture as usual, but for a very rare occasion, there'll be wine, even better, wine after the lecture in the lobby outside. So please come and join us for a glass of wine after the talk, and also a chance to buy a copy of our speaker's book. To introduce the event, our chair for this evening, my colleague, Dr. Stacey Gillis, Associate Dean of Education in the Faculty of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, and Head of the Gender Research Group. Stacey. Good evening, friends and colleagues. Um, as Chair, as Martin says, of the University's Gender Research Group and as Managing Editor of the journal Feminist Theory, I'm delighted to have been asked to chair this event. The British Academy is the UK's National Academy of the Humanities and Social Sciences. It mobilizes these disciplines to understand the world and shape a brighter future. It's an independent fellowship of world-leading scholars, a funding body for research, and a forum for debate. As such, the lecture program curated by the British Academy Fellowship, and of which this um, lecture um, is situated within, aims to stimulate discussion and debate. It reflects the wonderful breadth of our subjects and the academic perspectives within them. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Kate tonight. So Kate obtained her DPhil from Oxford, where she's currently in post as tutorial fellow in philosophy and Christian ethics at Regent's Park College. Her research interests are in post-Kantian philosophy, with a particular focus on Friedrich Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Simone de Beauvoir, as well as feminist philosophy more widely. She's published extensively on existentialism and phenomenology, ranging from work on St. Augustine to Sartre. She's the author, author of Sartre on Sin, published by Oxford UP in 2017, and the critically acclaimed biography, Becoming Beauvoir, published by Bloomsbury in 2019. The latter was reviewed incredibly widely, selected as one of the best books of 2019 by the Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian, and The Telegraph, and was translated into a number of languages, including German, Chinese, Turkish, and Korean. That is truly an international academic text, which is no mean feat. In 2021, Kate was awarded a British Academy Mid-Career Fellowship for her current work which is a philosophical commentary on Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, and we'll be hearing about this project this evening. Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex was published in French in 1949 and asked a very, very simple question. What is woman? And over the course of two volumes, which cover history, politics, literature, anatomy, geography, and more, de Beauvoir skillfully and painfully elucidates that humanity is male and that man, quote, defines woman as relative to him. Her rallying cry, one is not born but becomes a woman, is one of the foundations of feminist and later queer theory, and is also has the dubious honor of being the most cited um, thing in undergraduate essays in <laughs> stage one. The second sex stands alongside Christine de Pizan's The Book of the City of the Ladies, Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Woman, Germaine Greer's The Female Eunuch, and Lola Olufemi's Feminism Interrupted is one of those texts which has transformed the lives of individual readers. Picture me at 16, reading The Second Sex, and kind of going, oh, I now understand why the world is organized the way it is. But it's also substantially shaken all of these books. It's not yet knocked down, but soon we hope we'll do. Shaken the foundations of patriarchy. So we're delighted to have Kate here this evening to share her thoughts on Beauvoir and power. Thank you, Kate. Well, thank you. Um, thanks to the British Academy for the invitation to be here and for the support that I've had for this research. Thanks to the University of Newcastle and Insights NCL, um, and also to everyone who's here this evening to think with me about the second sex. Before turning to this contested text, I'd like to begin with another much more ancient one, a Buddhist parable from the Tita Sutta called The Blind Man and the Elephant. 
A group of blind men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to the town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. Out of curiosity, they said, we must inspect and know it by touch, of which we are capable. So they sought it out, and when they found it, they groped about it. The first person, whose hand landed on the trunk, said, this being is like a thick snake. For another, whose hand reached its ear, it seemed like a kind of fan. For another, who touched its leg, a pillar like a tree trunk. The blind man who placed his hand upon its side said that the elephant is a wall. Another who felt its tail described it as a rope. The last felt its tusk, stating that the elephant is that which is hard, smooth, and like a spear. I begin here because although I am no stranger to the philosophical traditions with which Beauvoir is no normally associated, phenomenology and existentialism especially, reading the philosophical secondary scholarship on the second sex regularly reminds me of this. If you touch one part of Beauvoir's book, some philosophers will tell you that she is Husserlian, another Sartrean, Heideggerian, or Merleau-Pontian, another again that she's a teacher and student of Lévi-Strauss, critic of Marx and Engels, Freud and Lacan, not to mention Kierkegaard, Hegel, or Nietzsche. And the part that philosophers usually neglect to discuss in detail, that is the extensive discussion of five literary authors at the end of volume one, uh, she is often called the mother of feminist literary criticism. This part, I think, must be something like the elephant's nostril. Philosophers don't want to touch it. Throughout volume two, and the part most often described as phenomenological, Beauvoir's argumentative interlocutors and textual sources come primarily from what we might call philosophies others, psychoanalysis, literature, and mysticism. For a long time, I have been asking, what kind of animal is the whole book? Is it one animal? The conclusion I've come to is yes, it is an axiological animal. Axiology is the study of the source and transmission of values. And in particular, it is an axiological animal concerned with the value of human freedom in all of its concrete, sensuous forms. But since the book is nearly 800 pages long, I can't defend this claim in a lecture of 45 minutes. My aim today is more modest. I'm going to offer a philosophical discussion on a neglected sentence and a neglected part, the elephant's nostril, to illustrate the centrality of axiology to this work and to resist this still persistent temptation to reduce the second sex to a slogan in an ahistorical and insufficiently materialist way, which I think distorts its feminist commitments and its place in the history of philosophy. In the published version of this lecture, I hope to offer an axiological map of the whole, a brief axiological map, but today's map is as follows. I'm gonna begin by introducing what I call the slogan temptation to summarize the central or most significant claim of the second sex to be that gender is socially constructed. Second, drawing on the work of three decades of Beauvoir scholars, I will outline four reasons I think we should resist this temptation. Third, I will introduce Beauvoir's axiological definition of woman and its roots in her moral philosophy before proceeding to discuss her critique of femininity as alienation. And finally, I will close with why I have called the second sex in the abstract for this lecture uh, an existential experiment. So, first, a social constructionist animal. One prominent answer to the question, what kind of animal is this book, especially since Judith Butler's influential 1986 paper, Sex and Gender in Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, is that the second sex is a social constructionist animal, and that its most distinguished contribution, in Butler's words, is that being female and being a woman are two very different sorts of being. Summarized in its most famous line, which we just heard from the beginning of volume two, that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Very early on in Beauvoir's career, she objected to the idea that existentialism, the philosophy to which she was committed in the 1940s, could be summarized in a slogan, claiming that no one could reasonably expect to understand Kant or Hegel after a sentence. For more than three decades, several Beauvoir scholars have argued against the early Butler that Beauvoir did not employ a sex-gender distinction, among them Sarah Heinema, Deborah Berghoffen, Claudia Card, Moira Gattens, Torl Moy, and Merrill Altman, 
and more recently, Megan Burke and Jennifer McWheeney, among many others. Moreover, they have shown, I think convincing, convincingly, that Beauvoir's actual views about sexual difference are more complex than this binary distinction allows. Those familiar with the interwar turn to the concrete in French philosophy will find it no surprise that Beauvoir rejected many dualisms of idealist metaphysics as abstractions that failed to do justice to the complexity of concrete reality. Before them, in the 19th century, Kierkegaard coined the term spiritlessness to describe human attempts at self-understanding that relied solely on the categories of nature and culture. Since however nuanced these categories may be, human experience is not merely natural or cultural, but what he called spiritual, characterized by the openness and possibility of freedom, as well as the limits of necessity and the given. Nevertheless, in the pages of philosophy journals, feminists continue to cite this slogan, as Nancy Bauer rightly writes, as if they were genuflecting on their way to their family pew. To give two examples, here are recent works by Sally Haslinger and Talia Mae Betcher, both of which cite it as a springboard to thinking about the metaphysics of sex and gender under the aegis of analytic philosophical discussions of social construction. Beauvoir famously claims, one is not born but rather becomes a woman. But when we say that gender is a social construct, could we possibly mean that individual women and men are social constructions? Many feminists have endorsed the view that the term woman names a social group status or role. Simone de Beauvoir famously wrote, one is not born but rather becomes a woman. No biological, psychological, or economic fate determines the figure that the human female presents in society. It is civilization as a whole that produces this creature. If Beauvoir is right, gender identity can't be innate. Now textually speaking, Butler's interpretation of the second sex and many subsequent constructivist readings are based on selections from the biology chapter in volume one and the childhood chapter of volume two, sometimes this paragraph that's cited here alone. And given that these parts are among the most often set on university reading lists, uh, it's, it's not really surprising that this view continues to proliferate, despite the fact that many other readings have been advanced against it and arguments made against the, pl the plausibility of this one. So for today's purposes, I'm going to briefly outline four, namely Beauvoir's language, her moral psychological views, her knowledge of the history of philosophy, and her attention to the concept <laughs> genius. The second sex never uses the word gender. And in it, the word woman does not always feature as what we call today a gender term, to name something cultural. As Maura Gattens has pointed out, Beauvoir's terms of analysis include woman, feminine, and female human being, and these are combined in the text in many possible combinations, as this table demonstrates. Now, the logicians in the room will note that this does not include all possible permutations, but their precise number is even more difficult to identify than this implies because considerations of translation make the matter even more complex. In French, féminin, what we would translate as feminine, can be used as a sex term to refer to female anatomy, and femelle, Female does not translate directly into English as female, because at the time it was a term usually reserved for animals such as livestock. And when Beauvoir does use it to describe human beings, she knows that it's going to be dissonant. It's going to ring strangely in her, in her reader, reader's ears to hear la femelle humaine. Beauvoir also uses the term woman with a lowercase w, of course it's French with a lowercase f, uh, and woman with a capital W, to distinguish between concrete real women and the myths or imaginary idealizations of women, respectively. Second, Beauvoir's existentialism, that is her philosophical commitments, entails a rejection of the idea that human beings have any essence or identity prior to existence. Indeed, she sees the desire to have a fixed identity which she calls, uh, in the, the terminology of her day, the desire for being, as susceptible to bad faith. 
bad faith is tempting because of her understanding of the structure of what it means to be human and what I call the desire for rest. Beauvoir claimed that the temporality of being human involves the perpetual temptation to self-reification. We want to make ourselves something so that we can say with certainty, I am what I am. Instead of admitting that we are perpetually in the process of becoming and that this process is intersubjective, intersubjective vulnerable, and sometimes restless. Sometimes we don't know who we are. <laughs> she agreed with Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Sartre that it is common to want to avoid the estranging distances and self-questioning that characterize being human in time. But on her view, there is no self in the sense of a pre-existing essence or persistent personal identity, or in the sense on some theological pictures that each human being is called to a particular vocation by God. Rather, she thinks that there's a flowing spontaneity of consciousness, and that flowing spontaneity of consciousness desires, loves, and projects itself towards the future through action. The experience of not being, as she puts it, installed ahead of time waiting for myself involves constant tension. The answer to the question, who am I, is always open. The restless tension of possibility is not always assumed authentically because some prefer to take flight, as she puts it, in bad faith, alibis, or philosophies of imminence, where values are fixed and the outcome of your actions is given. Now, third, if the thesis that being female and being a woman are two very different sorts of being were the distinguishing contribution of the second sex, it would be a rather unoriginal work the point of which could have been made in a small fraction of the words Beauvoir employed. The idea that femininity or the social inferiority of women was a result of context-specific social formation had been advanced at least since the 17th century Cartesian Poulain de la Barre, and Beauvoir knew this. Poulain was not only the source of one of her epigraphs in this book, but he provoked a famous and influential reaction from Rousseau. The many men who wrote about how females should be educated in order to become women also knew it. In 1721, for example, Montesquieu's Persian letters treated, quote, the great question among men, namely whether it was more advantageous to remove women's freedom or let them keep it. For Rousseau, only men should be educated to the genius of their freedom. Women, by contrast, were to be educated to, quote, please and serve them. He says, the whole education of women ought to be relative to men. Beauvoir's question wasn't whether women were socially constructed, but to use her own term, how they were constituted and why many in becoming women felt alienated from their bodies, their labor, and their love for others and themselves. Why, she asks in the introduction, do women not contest male sovereignty? Quote, where does this submission in women come from? And ultimately, at the end of the introduction, when she's about to launch off into volume one, how in the feminine condition can a human being accomplish herself? Fourth, Beauvoir knew when she wrote the sentence, on ne n'est pas femme, on le devient, that previous sentences of this form had been written. Some of them concerned humanist education, like Erasmus's, one is not born but becomes a man and others concerned human freedom. Alfred Fouillet, a philosopher of freedom that Beauvoir read and admired in her youth, wrote that one is not born but becomes free. And finally, to get to the title concept of this lecture, Beauvoir herself had written in volume one that one is not born but becomes a genius. Now, whether one's interest in Beauvoir stems from an interest in the history of philosophy, the ethics of feminist reception, or contemporary feminist politics, I think we are still not getting, as Toromoy put it, the Beauvoir we deserve. That Beauvoir, in my view, is a Beauvoir who wrote all of the second sex. And in it, she offered an axiological critique of biological, psychoanalytic, and historical materialist attempts to define woman as projective abstractions, and argued that instead of accepting a battle of the sexes, men and women would both benefit from understanding that ideological and technological revolutions required them to revalue their values to each other and their relations to each other in new ways. 
She agreed with Marx that values arise from the ensemble of social relations, and with Nietzsche that they required revaluation if men and women were to be less alienated from each other and themselves. But she also charged these philosophers with failing to see that their visions of value were incomplete. To be a woman on the axiological definition Beauvoir introduces early in volume one of The Second Sex is to be a female human being in search of values within a world of values. On her view, all human beings are axiological animals. We are all constantly evaluating. You are deciding to pay attention to me or to be distracted by the clock on the wall. Uh, your, 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 your consciousness is, is, your attention in itself is evaluative. But in 1949, those born female were discouraged from or even punished for, be, for being evaluative individuals, and they were represented as inferior in economic, aesthetic, religious, and moral spheres of value. And they often experienced their own female bodies or those of others as devalued and depersonalized. In that world, the world of France in 1949, France executed its last woman by guillotine in the 1940s for conducting abortions. In the same decade, women received the right to vote and emerged from occupation with a new declaration of human rights. Some men were feeling self-satisfied about their generosity. Some women thought the fight was over. On Beauvoir's view, however, the rights of French women not to be beheaded, to vote, or as Article 4 of the Declaration of Human Rights puts it, to be held in servitude were not enough to transform women's concrete situation because of the gap between law and custom, between the rights we avow and the human actions that fail to meet their standards or our hopes. Whatever abstract rights women had on paper, and in France in 1949, they still lacked many, in their daily lives, conceptions of the natural, customs of femininity, and asymmetrical ideals of love and self-love were invoked by both men and women to defend a hierarchy of the sexes, which Beauvoir condemned for perpetuating, quote, absolute evil. The second sex, as Beauvoir introduced it, was an attempt to take stock of the current state, those are her words, take stock, in, of the women in France after an era of muddled controversy. Although methodological statements are rare in the second sex, here and elsewhere she restricts her scope, the scope of this project, to a particular place, France, and time the current state. Lest the reader forget, she regularly roots her analysis in her present, using the word today over 150 times in the pages that follow. And that's only if you search for aujourd'hui, if you look for things like de nos jours or actuellement, like it's a lot of times that she says, I'm talking about now. So what does this have to do with becoming a genius. Julia Kristeva claims that Beauvoir's talk of ge genius is provocative hyperbole. And given how little is discussed by philosophical scholars, they could be seen to be tacitly in agreement. But genius, like woman, is a concept with multiple histories. And it is to Rousseau and Nietzsche that I will turn to today to illuminate Beauvoir's axiological project in the second sex and especially the part philosophers don't like to talk about, that nostril, her discussion of myths in five literary authors. So Beauvoir shares <clears throat> with Rousseau, Nietzsche, and many others in the history of philosophy, an interest in exemplarist moral theory. That is an emphasis on the importance of learning from examples, learning from good exemplars in the moral and political formation of both children and adults and attention to the ways that our moral and political affects shape us, our emotions shape us morally and politically. From her early student notebooks all the way to the second sex, Beauvoir discusses this concept of genius, which I think illuminates the structure of this as a work of moral and political philosophy, as an axiological animal concerned with the source and transmission of values. In Nietzsche's text, Schopenhauer as educator, he describes a variety of desire common to human experience that he calls our immeasurable longing to become whole. 
to find our own genius, or as he most famously put it, to become who we are. So, he writes that we are responsible to ourselves for our own existence. Consequently, we want to be the true helmsman of this existence and to refuse our existence to resemble a mindless act of chance. Writing against Ralph Waldo Emerson's view that imitation is suicide, Emerson thought that imitation was suicide because it amounted to a failure to be true to yourself, uh, Nietzsche thinks that actually admiration of a certain kind is a necessary component of becoming a self, but we have to learn how to admire in the right way. He says, true educators and formative teachers reveal the true basic material of your being in a process of liberation. Drawing on the image of Heraclides ever-changing river, Nietzsche compares human existence to being submerged in a stream. The water keeps flowing and we are too busy treading it to lift our heads very high above the surface. So Nietzsche says, we have to be lifted up. And the people who do this lifting are true men, philosophers, artists, and saints. These people are, in the Nietzschean sense of the word, exemplars. They're not ideals to imitate exactly, but spurs that lead individuals to feel a fruitful discontentment with themselves. This contentment is fruitful because it motivates the person without shame or envy to desire to surpass their present state and to be a better person or cultivate some excellence or perfection that they don't currently possess. Phenomenologically speaking, we might say that an exemplar's excellence discloses concrete possibilities. It makes you think, oh, maybe I could be like that. There are temporary inspirations that set the bar of your aspirations at its ideal height. Nietzschean exemplars are not to be conflated with heroes. On Nietzsche's view, a hero implies an otherness that encourages ethically impotent, it, it encourages ethically impotent admiration. There's no power in it, because if you classify another person as a hero, you, give, you often give yourself an alibi not to be challenged by them, because they belong to a different category. Not a human, not a mere human like you. And that can then lead you to resist the demand for self-transformation that admiration sometimes brings with it. Inspiration by exemplars, by contrast, requires only, Nietzsche says, the seriousness of the efficient workman. In human, all too human, he dismisses much talk of genius and innate talent as counterproductive. It perpetuates the herd mentality by making genius and talent, or indeed virtue, to be matters of nature rather than habituation. So here's some Nietzschean bombast for you. He says, do not talk about being gifted or possessing innate talent. One can name great men of all kinds who were not very gifted. They acquired greatness, became geniuses, as we put it, through making the most of qualities which no one would care to admit he did not have. They all possess the seriousness of the efficient workman. Exemplars play an important role in moral formation on Nietzsche's account because in the wake of the so-called death of God and the loss in, a, in faith in a transcendent value, he claimed that a revaluation of values is necessary. But humans are axiological animals. We can't think of values without reference to existing values of which we are aware. So Nietzschean self-creation is not creation out of nothing and our admiration does not arise in a vacuum. Now we know from Beauvoir's student diaries that in the late 1920s, Beauvoir was asking questions about va value nihilism. That is, in simple terms, uh, the view that all values are baseless. And she was asking this question not as an abstract philosophical exercise, but as an interrogation of how she should understand her life and live it. She wrote in her diary at the tender age of 20, Maybe I have values, no, sorry, maybe I have value, but then values must exist. We also know that she continued to have this interest in axiology uh, in the 1940s, and that she wrote about it in, as a philosophical and existential problem in her moral period, reading Nietzsche, as well as the works of Karl Marx, Max Scheler, Jean-Paul Sartre, and her personalist and Marxist contemporaries. 
So these sources informed her claims of the moral essays in the 1940s before the second sex, namely Puris and Sinius and The Ethics of Ambiguity. And in those texts, she claimed that value creation is not a solitary enterprise. Although each human being's freedom is a source of value, not all human beings are free from material need or educated to value the axiological power of their, their own and others' freedom. The seriousness of the efficient workman is not all one needs to become a genius. There are material and moral conditions that must be met, such as food for the body and other people who see you with eyes that are open to your freedom. Here and in this introduction to the second sex, Beauvoir tells her reader that the evaluative perspective she adopts is existentialist morality. And something that unites Butler's with other Hegelian readings of the second sex, such as Nancy Bowers, is their tendency to ignore the materialist dimension of this ethics, its economic and historical analysis, and the similarity of her approach to those of other French Marxists in the second quarter of the 20th century, especially in my view, uh, Henri Lefebvre and Norbert Grichemann's work on mystified consciousness and the critique of everyday life. I'll return to this, but first it's important to say why this neglect is not very surprising. Thanks to the work of Margaret Simons and Toro Moy, it is now widely known that the first English translation of The Second Sex, which came out in 1953 uh, and was done in the United States, was the Cold War translation, which cut 15% of Beauvoir's words including all of her references to socialist feminisms and inconsistently rendered her philosophical vocabulary, including terms like alienation, and excluded or distorted long passages of her discussion of women's work and her treatments of alienated domestic or sexual labor. The unavailability in English and subsequent neglect of important materialist dimensions of Beauvoir's analysis, I think have obscured the multi-level axiological analysis that she offers in her depiction of bourgeois femininity as alienation. In what she called the present state of education and customs, Beauvoir believed that women struggled to develop the rapport à soi, the relation to themselves, that comes from recognizing themselves as capable of their own genius as evaluative individuals. And in tracing the origins of this struggle, she expanded on her developmental account of human freedom in the ethics of ambiguity. There she claimed that human beings are given in childhood exemplars of admirability. Some human childhoods, she says, offer an apprenticeship in freedom, where children are encouraged in developmentally appropriate ways to think reflectively about what they value and fashion the ideals that shape their lives. But not all humans receive this apprenticeship. Many are discouraged from asking themselves whether they really value the values they inherit. The precept of Beauvoir's ethics is that the other should be treated as a freedom so that his end may be freedom. In the absence of a God or a transcendent source of value, no individual's good can be defined a priori from without. To value freedom rightly, Beauvoir claims, is to reject, quote, all previous justifications which might be drawn from the civilization, the age, and the culture. It is the rejection of every principle of authority. But this does not mean anything goes. Valuing, valuing freedom in practice involves appropriately acknowledging the limits imposed by others and by nature. But valuing freedom is difficult. In childhood, we are thrust into a world that is not of our making. Quote, thrown into a universe which she has not contributed to constituting, which was fashioned without her and which appears to, as an absolute to which she cannot but submit. End quote. In the child's eyes, human inventions, such as customs and morals, are given facts. She says they're ineluctable, like the sky and the trees. They're just there. The child lives in a world that she calls a serious world, accepting that these values are just there. And that seriousness makes values appear to be ready-made things. For many, childhood is a privileged, metaphysically privileged situation, she says. You feel comfortable in the world in childhood. You feel like you know your place in the world. And obviously not everyone does, but some do. And Beauvoir says, in those situations, the child escapes the anguish of freedom 
and feels protected from the risk of existence, quote, by the ceiling which human generations have built over his head. Beauvoir agrees with Rousseau's claim in Emile that it can be developmentally appropriate for children to be habituated to accept other people's opinions, to rely on others for their knowledge of the world and themselves. However, this reliance can outlive its developmental usefulness. And in those cases, uh, Rousseau talks about uh, the, the problem of taking the sentiment of your own existence from other people instead of uh, fr from yourself. And Beauvoir puts it slightly differently. She says, the taste of my own life. The taste of my own life should be how I taste my life, not what other people says it is. <laughs> so if the reliance outlives its developmentally appropriateness, then something has gone wrong in becoming an evaluative individual in their own right. Now, when freedom comes of age and an adolescent recognizes the evaluative power of their freedom, it can be seen as a deliverance. The collapse of childhood seriousness can be a joyful liberation. But even when it is joyful, Beauvoir claims, it is confusing. The world is populated by many conflicting values. And the plurality of them can provoke a species of potentially fruitful discontentment, which I've called elsewhere exemplary vertigo. The dizzy possibility of realizing that not all of the morals preached at you at once can be true. And you're going to have to choose what is valuable for yourself. The world of values is not ready-made. And like it or not, you contribute to making it. She writes, this is the moment when he decides, talking about the adolescent, if what might be called the natural history of an individual, his affective complexes, etc., depend above all on his childhood, it is adolescence which appears as the moment of moral choice. Freedom is then revealed, and he must decide on his attitude in the face of it. The natural history of the individual is central to understanding an individual's attitude to freedom, because on Beauvoir's view, it is always on the basis of we have, what we have been that we decide what we want to be. Beauvoir's account in The Ethics of Ambiguity goes on to give several sketches of exemplars or models uh, of common existential stances that are adopted in order to deny freedom and to flee that responsibility. Uh, so she, she talks about the serious man, the subman, the nihilist, the adventurer. And each of these kind of stances serve to illustrate that in some conditions, very fresh in the mind of the recently occupied France and those who had witnessed the rise of fascism in Europe, exemplars could serve an ideological function, whether to serve the idols of the nation or the family, or to provide alibis for inaction. Where Nietzsche could speak of true men who inspired ethical admiration, and Schopenhauer talked about lighthouses of humanity, when Beauvoir considered the prominent female exemplars of her time and culture, she found few true women, but instead a multiplicity of incompatible myths, almost all of which constituted women to feel that their value was dependent on what she called being for men. So this is what, this is, what I think is happening here. Whereas Rousseau's Emile is given Robinson Crusoe to read to encourage his understanding of freedom as the greatest good, in one of the least discussed sections of the second sex, Beauvoir analyzed narrative exemplars of women and five then influential authors. In all of them, to become a woman was not to become free, but to accept the alienation of her freedom in the name of love. The first, Henri de Montalon, a prominent writer then, later elected to the Académie Française, was the author of an anti-feminist tetralogy, Les Jeunes Filles, which sold millions of copies and was translated into 13 languages. Beauvoir objects to Montalon's literature because he provides no exemplars of women as conscious persons in their own right. Montalon's male protagonists desire domination. Their heroic status is always achieved at the cost of the subordination of others in many social hierarchies. And Meryl Altman rightly emphasizes in her re recent book, Beauvoir in Time, that Beauvoir's discussion catalogs not only his sexist, but also his orientalist, racist, and Nazi sympathies. Beauvoir's D.H. Lawrence II quote, passionately believes in male supremacy, and quote, detests modern women who claim a consciousness. 
For Lawrence, women are made to give, not take. The Catholic writer Paul Claudel presents women as a risk taken by God in creation, a kind of cosmic wild card. Quote, woman is the element of risk he deliberately introduced into the midst of his marvelous construction. A risk redeemed when she loves and gives. Only one of the literary writers that Beauvoir considers commands her qualified moral respect. Stendhal was scandalized by the condition imposed on women, and he found the source of the faults blamed on them in that condition rather than in their nature. Stendhal was expli explicitly interested in the question of women's genius, writing that, quote, all the geniuses who are born women are lost for the public good. When chance offers them the means to prove themselves, watch them attain the most difficult skills, end quote. In his literature on Beauvoir's reading, women are subjects, and his heroines are never described, quote, as a function of his heroes. He provides them with their own destinies. This part of the second sex explicitly acknowledges that the myths of greatness conveyed by moral exemplars are differently orchestrated in each individual, depending on the axiological history, the material conditions, the entire situation <coughs> of the reader. In each of the authors that Beauvoir considers, however, whether fascist, surrealist, romantic, atheist, or Catholic, the true woman is a woman whose destiny is to love a man. Quote, in any case, what is demanded of her is self-forgetting and love. Dominant myths of woman, analyzed by Beauvoir, define them like Rousseau's education said they should in relation to men, and promised women their desires, that their desires for rest and recognition would be met in, in relative lives, in lives where they were someone's wife, mother, mistress, tire, prostitute, or mystic instead of encouraging them to pursue the kinds of projects that tend to be given the moniker genius. But, Beauvoir pointed out, quote, to be is to have become. Whereas Nietzsche dismissed talk of genius, innate talent, and virtue as counterproductive to human flourishing, Beauvoir turned to concepts of femininity and love to subject them to a similar scrutiny, asking why some took sexual hierarchy to be a matter of nature rather than habituation. In volume one of The Second Sex, she claimed that one is not born, but becomes a genius. And the feminine condition has until now rendered this becoming impossible. This concern does not disappear from the book after volume one. She returns to it at the end of volume two and claiming that to explain woman's limits, quote, we must refer to her situation and not to a mysterious essence. The idea that woman has no creative genius has been defended ad nauseum. Now, it is important to clarify that Beauvoir does not object to self-forgetting or love in themselves. In her ethics, the practice of valuing freedom requires generosity. Rather, she objects to these exemplars on the grounds that they are indicative of men's historical failure to understand reciprocity. In order to forget oneself, one must have become an evaluative individual who can value forgetting herself. In order for love to be generous, it must be free. And in contexts where women were not educated to their own freedom, but expected to give unreciprocally, exemplars of great women often served an ideological function for both men and women, leading to disappointment and alienation for both. In such mythological conditions, woman's freedom is frustrated. Her future is not open. Her love cannot be received as a gift. On this axiological reading of the second sex, volume two, lived experience, rejects the then prominent models of uh, Freudian psychosexual development, claiming that it is not female anatomy that causes inferiority complexes in women, or the feelings of passivity, alienation, and shame that so many throughout the history of philosophy and sexuality have associated with female bodies. Rather, girlhood and adolescence on Beauvoir's developmental account, offers instead of an apprenticeship to freedom, an apprenticeship to alienation, during which many felt torn between their own experience and the expectation to conform to myths of femininity that depersonalize their bodies and valorize 
alienated labor, and alienated love. Running throughout this volume is attention to the variation of ways the female body can be lived, and the importance of considering variations in women's economic and axiological dependence on men, since many, in 1949, had been apprenticed to dependence on men for both their livelihoods and the meaning of their lives. What was novel about her analysis was not a thesis about sex and gender, nor that the word woman embodies no set concept, but rather a set of men's uh, incompatible projections. And as Sarah Heinema points out, <coughs> Nietzsche and Kierkegaard had already said this too. Uh, so I'll give you one example from Nietzsche. In the gay science, uh, there's a young man who's taken to a wiser older man out of concern that he's being corrupted by women. And the wise old man's response is that one has to raise men better. The failings of women should be atoned for and set right in men, for man makes himself the image of woman, and woman shapes herself according to this image. Rather, Beauvoir's significant contribution, I think, was her axiological analysis, both existentialist and Marxist, of the genealogy and perpetuation of sexual hierarchy in her society, and the existential frustration this caused for women whose situations did not meet the material and moral conditions of freedom. Women whose openness to the future and to the possibility of communication with others were curtailed. This evil, she claimed, was one that men and women were both, though not equally and not identically, responsible for redressing. The hierarchy of the sexes was not a given justified by God, nature, or man, but rather a mystification that perpetuated suffering and prevented humanity from attaining an understanding of the human species being that truly deserved the name human. Far from universalizing about sex and gender from her perspective, um, as some critics have charged, I think she offers a local genealogy of sexual hierarchy and analysis of the formation of winter, sorry, the formation of women under the present state of education and customs, in which the target of her critique includes particular bourgeois conceptions of love and their alienating consequences, whether narcissism in the texts of psychoanalysis, conjugal love in French literature, or the Hegelian Council of Bourgeois Mothers. Now, I said earlier that I think in this respect, her analysis is similar to Gutemann and Lefebvre in The Mystified Consciousness. And in that text, they argued that speculative philosophy and focusing on ideas and the system of things wasn't really properly related to the real. Its focus was not on transforming the things themselves in the praxis of everyday life. Philosophy, they wrote, quote, in disdaining the mass of men disdains also the mass of quotidian moments to, of life to which it pretends to bring meaning. They proposed a science of ideology, including analyzing literature as an expression of the consciousness of modern men and bourgeois illusions to illuminate what they called the gap between life and the ideas that man makes of life. In volume one, drawing on many of the same authors discussed by Gutemann and Lefebvre, including Montanon, Lawrence, Stendhal, and Nietzsche, Beauvoir explores a multiplicity of incompatible myths of woman to illuminate the gap between the ideas that man makes of woman and the lives women live. She claimed that to understand inhuman relations between people, economic analysis and the imminent critique of religion were not enough. Materialist philosophers must also consider the human desires for rest and recognition, to love and be loved, and the values involved in women's quotidian loves and labor. Although Beauvoir does not always tell us who her political interlocutors are, her existentialist approach engages critically with Christians and secularists, personalists and Marxists alike, claiming that it is not only by projecting gods that men have sought to flee the injustice of this world, but also through the splitting and projection of men's ambiguity and ambivalent fears and fantasies about life onto women. And while both men and women may seek to flee the human condition, that is, the reality of suffering, the restlessness of temporality, the possibility of freedom, and the ambiguity of being both spirit and matter, consciousness and flesh, Philosophers, she claimed, have constituted the world and philosophy itself in ways that give men alibis, making human misery and sexual hierarchy natural instead of situations for which we are responsible and could transform. 
So, in drawing to, to a conclusion, I wish to return briefly to my claim uh, in the lecture's abstract that the second sex is an existential experiment with a liberatory aim. On Beauvoir's view, that existentialist precept that you should treat others as freedom so that their end may be freedom, applied no less to the action of writing than it did to any other. To write ethically is to appeal to the freedom of others. And you don't do that by telling them to accept the truth according to yours truly. Rather, you invite the reader into axiologically complex terrain, where conflicts of interpretation are not resolved and answers are not ready-made. Like many philosophers before her, Beauvoir explicitly reflected on the power of texts with multiple voices, what we might call following Kierkegaard in direct communication or following Bakhtin polyphony. Uh, these plurivocal texts can elicit axiological engagement in ways that are educative to freedom, provoking the reader through irony and uncertainty, anger, pleasure, and laughter to ask, what is this? Is this what I value? Unlike the blind men describing the elephant from without, Beauvoir encouraged her readers to reflect on their own experiences of value from within, to reject myths of women for the genius of their own and others' freedom. My experience of teaching and discussing this text with multiple generations of those readers confirms that despite the passage of time, it still invites many to call their worlds and themselves into question, to feel the restlessness that is midwife to freedom's possibility. Her exemplars may not be ours, but her invitation to resist the simplistic and spiritless determinisms of nature and culture, to keep asking what has humanity made of the human female and how in the feminine condition can a human being accomplish herself, still offers many an apprenticeship to resisting alienation.